Hello, I'm Tara Graveson. I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University and welcome to vlog 198, how to establish and maintain a professional relationship with your supervisor. Wow, how amazing. This vlog comes via request from Marika. Marika sent me an email, a very moving email, where she talked about what professionalism was for her and that involved answering emails in a timely fashion by her supervisor, regular meetings with her supervisor, and perhaps most sadly, her supervisor acknowledging her in the workplace, just acknowledging that she exists in the corridor of her lab. Now, they're pretty straightforward attributes, I think, as part of a professional relationship, but they are proxies and often inelegant ones. So we're going to really dig deeply into that phrase professional relationship today. We've done lots of vlogs on boundaries between students and supervisors, sex <laughs> and between students and supervisors, but this one I really wanted to tightly focus on the professional relationship. And this is an important issue, there is no doubt about that, and there is no doubt that PhD students are treated badly around the world. They're treated well as well, but they're also treated badly. I've told this story before, soon after I arrived back from the United Kingdom into Australia, I was in a meeting with some very senior people at a particular university, and PhD students were described as slaves. And that's bad enough. But after they were described as slaves, hang on to yourself, all the members of that meeting proceeded to laugh. Now a supervisor recently said to me before Christmas, why would I supervise a student if I can't get authorship on publications? Because obviously there's a lot of volatility around publications and authorship in Australia at the moment, quite rightly. And supervisors are being confronted about their expectations of authorship. But I thought that was a remarkable phrase. Why would I be supervising? If I can't get authorship, why would I be supervising? I have many answers to that question, but that's another vlog. And also a PhD student came into my office very, very recently very upset and she said to me you know what i'm not a phd student i'm a paper generating machine okay so this is going incredibly well not but i also need to tell you about the other side of the frontier too students can be incredibly frightening to their supervisors they can stalk their supervisors they can leave random weird notes on their cars and as a lot of you know, I've had to have a panic button installed in my office because a few students have tried to physically intimidate me in my office. So students and supervisors can send unspeakable emails. I see them on a daily basis. They say absolutely appalling things to each other and are personally abusive. So this is not going well either way. So that's why this is the time for this vlog. And look, I'm going to be quite prescriptive and I'm, I'm going to say in many ways the unsayable today. I'm going to confront you with your own expectations and hopes and assumptions. So it's not going to be a comfortable vlog, okay? But as I always say, control what you can control. And if your PhD student if, sorry, if your PhD supervisor thinks that PhD students are slaves, if they think that you are simply a paper generating machine, then you have some choices to make. There is very little you can do except try and organise the expectations at the start. So what's your minimum requirement of a supervisor? And be very clear on that and come to the relationship with that. This is my minimum requirement. If that's not met, then yep, it is time to change supervisors, even early on. But what I'm trying to do is focus today on you, on your goals and on your behaviour, and how that behaviour and those goals can create a professional relationship. And the other thing I have to say to you is these can be lifelong relationships. If you get this right, and I really hope you do, and I'm providing the strategies to get it right today, if you get this right, then your supervisor can be a referee for 30 years. 
30 years, incredible. But actually, and no one tells you this, if you get the relationship really right, then you end up being a referee for your supervisor. My late husband, Professor Steve Redhead, of course, had incredible relationships, taught hundreds of postgraduates around the world, and many of his PhD students went on to great fame, transformative knowledge, and professorships, chairs around the world. And near the end of his career, his last two or three posts, his former PhD students, professors, chairs, famous, ended up being his referee. And that's the way of the world. That's the way it should be. It is a relationship. Certainly it is a power relationship between a student and a PhD supervisor, but the power relationship does change through time. And many of my students have gone on to extraordinary professorships. I'm incredibly proud of them. And team, that's the point. We're training you to be better than we are. That's what we're doing here. So with that hope, <laughs> with that promise, I'm going to introduce five do's and five don'ts to establishing a professional relationship with your supervisor. And remember, my focus is on professional relationship. Right, do one. Establish clear expectations, behaviours and frameworks for your relationship right at the start. This is it. So you determine how you will be treated. I'm going to say that again. You determine how you will be treated. And you need to establish those parameters, right? What, what are your expectations? And you've got help here at Flinders University. We have a supervisory charter. We have a charter that lists the rights and the responsibilities of supervisors and students. Very clear, very concise. So our PhD students take that document into their first meeting and present the expectations. For our wonderful friends around the world team, just put into Google HDR charter, Flinders University. That'll pop up. Please feel free to use it. I also have my supervisory setup document, which is available, open access from academia.edu. You can certainly use that. But don't assume that everybody knows how to be a student or how to be a supervisor. And please don't assume that you think in the same way as your supervisor. What you need to do is you need to speak the words. You need to state your expectations and if it's clear very early on that you and your supervisor disagree on just about everything and what you disagree on are deal breakers for you, then you know what? Call it. Call it early and end the relationship early. One of my most remarkable stories that happened to a PhD student at Flinders, in the first three weeks, weird stuff was happening. Bonkers emails, you know, full train wreck in the first three weeks. And the student called it like after getting these absolutely bizarre things going on, she said, you know what, I I I'm sorry, I, I wish you well and thank you for the opportunity, but uh, you're no longer my supervisor. Three weeks in, can I say that student a year on is doing fantastically well. So have a think about that. So they're really the choices you have to make. Either you change your supervisor or you change your expectations. That's how you create a professional relationship. Do two. Step back and assemble your priorities. So before you're having any conversation with any supervisors, step back, what's important to you? You have priorities. Your supervisor has priorities. And the chances are they are not the same priorities. Okay, your supervisor may be interested in your project, your supervisor might not be interested in your project, but you have to create traction and momentum on your goals. It is a cliche, and I hate using this cliche, but every now and again, as Dean, it pops out of my mouth, and it does have meaning. And that cliche is, it's your thesis. So when students come in and list the catalogue of all the things the supervisors are doing wrong, at a certain point, I do have to say, Sorry to say this, 
but it is your thesis. Your supervisor's already got a thesis. Your supervisor is probably supervising 5, 10, 15 other PhD students with their own theses. So you have to be, and this might be the moment for you, okay? You have to be the project manager for your higher degree. So in some ways, yes, the word student's important, and I'm a big believer in the student, the higher degree student, but also you are a project manager of that research, okay? And because of that, it means your supervisor is a resource, your associate supervisor is a resource, the library, the wonderful librarians are a resource, the Office of Graduate Research is a resource, Twitter is a resource. So you must assume responsibility. Do not relinquish responsibility. Don't wait for your supervisor to take control of the project. I hear very frequently in situations that really don't end well where a student said, I'm simply waiting for the supervisor to tell me what to do next. Dude, your thesis. Do three. Huge. Change my life. Luckily I worked this one out early in my 20s. Change my life. Do three. Be goal oriented rather than personality oriented. So what is the goal of your PhD candidature? Focus on the outcomes, focus on the goals. Too often, PhD students talk about personalities or how they feel about that person. And actually that's about personal relationships. It doesn't have anything at all to do with what we're discussing today, that's personal stuff. Your supervisor is not your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your mother, your father or your partner. You have to take out that emotional intensity. Focus on the research goals rather than how you feel about your supervisor. Do four. Start with respect for all people, including your supervisor. Social media, and I love social media, you know that, I work on it, I research in it, it's important. But social media in so many ways has had a bad effect on us. Because we want likes, we want loves, we want retweets, we want comments. We want to be the star of our digital lives. We want popularity, not respect. And we need to remember that universities are medieval institutions. Hierarchy, respect, decency, integrity. Popularity and intelligence are two very different things. The world is in the state that it is now because we have confused popularity and intelligence. So come to every single conversation with decency. Don't slam doors, don't shout, don't create drama, intrigue or controversy, which leads to do five, stay calm. Just about every bad situation I have seen, and I have to manage, between a student and a supervisor has happened when either the student or the supervisor jumps the shark. Jump the shark, real hard to manage from there. Now, let's be clear, he's gorgeous. Let's be clear here, you are a PhD student. You are not a guest star on Bold and the Beautiful. Stay calm. Don't create conflict and agitation and the weird looks and all that sort of stuff. Let's not do that. The trembling lip. Don't do that. You may like to think about, and this shows you the scale of what we are dealing with in the contemporary university at the moment. I'm just going to present this to you. You might like to think about what state a student would be in where we have a situation where a young male PhD student, six foot two, reaches across the desk of a dean to physically intimidate me because he wasn't getting his way. Comes across the desk at me. Now I'm five foot two and I'm 50 years of age. So we've now reached a point where this type of behaviour is normal 
and normalized. So no matter how weird or bad or strange you are feeling, please be calm. You are doing a PhD. You are not running a nuclear war. They're different. So if you ever feel yourself getting a bit shouty, wanting to slam a few doors and so forth, and you know what, take yourself out of that situation. Go for a walk, calm, and then return to address the facts and the ideas, not the emotion. Okay, let's get into the don'ts. So you thought that was terribly buoyant and exciting. Let's get into the negative don'ts now. Crunchy. Don't one. Don't assume that your supervisor is a friend or a family member. Crucial. It is very important now more than ever that we have a very clear professional relationship between you and your supervisor and that line, that those relationships must never blur, never blur. Don't blur or merge your responsibilities. Right now, last few years, it's been very important that we are part of the Me Too movement. That has been transformative of the world and we needed to make those changes. Further in Australia, and I'm incredibly proud of it, we had a couple of years ago the Respect Now Always report released and we now have the policy and the procedure throughout our universities in Australia to make sure that sexual assault and sexual harassment never happens in our universities. One case is too many. So therefore, in this new world, so what happened five years ago, what happened ten years ago, gone, gone. So in this new world, I have very clear don'ts. I don't ever drink alcohol with my students. I don't have coffee. I don't have a meal with my students. Students never come to my home. I never go to their home. My students don't even have my mobile phone number and I don't have theirs. I see my students in my office during a designated time and then they leave. It's no longer the 1970s man. It's no longer even the 1990s. It is too risky for staff and students to mix socially. Full stop. Those days are gone. Those days are over. And if you want a professional relationship, which was the task given to me today, then that relationship is location specific. Mischief, bad stuff happens when there's an assumption that a supervisor and a student are friends. So if you want a professional relationship, then that professional relationship has a location, has a geography, and that does not include your home, your supervisor's home or a bar ever. Don't too. Don't ignore the feedback. Wow, these are the crunchy ones, aren't they? So the moment you ignore the feedback, you're disrespecting your supervisor, you're disrespecting their time, and a lot of supervisors tend to drift away at that point. So if you decide in your thesis, because it's your thesis, you're the project manager, if you decide the supervisor's offered this feedback and you're going to take it into a different direction, that's great, that's cool, but you need to explain that to your supervisor and use the critique in a different way. The critique or the feedback is there for a reason. So remember as you're making this alternative argument to keep considering the feedback. Don't ignore it though, and this happens in my office a lot, I come in, they, students come in and I say, what's happening? And they, they say, oh look, I'm going to ignore my supervisor's feedback because it's just too hard. It's just too hard, I can't be bothered. Too hard, can't be bothered. Or it's confronting to your particular views or perspectives. We see that a lot in methodology. So when your supervisors are trying to protect you and say, look, if you use this method, that's fine, but these other methods are available, can you just make sure that you show an awareness of those alternative methodologies? and the students are often evangelically committed to a singular method and that will get them into trouble so you can see what's going on. Now there's nothing sadder or more debilitating for a supervisor to continue to confront the same errors in draft after draft after draft. So we make the corrections, read the next draft and the errors are still there. And we do know that if those corrections are not made, examiners will pick it up. And I'll just tell you a story that happened actually in December, a month ago, where a student had received a D, had received a major rewrite, 
restructure, it's going to have to go back out to examiners, so it's not a good result. And mostly supervisors hide from me at that point, so they sort of hide. And I understand why, it's a, a very confronting result. But I had a remarkable man come into my office, come in, make an appointment, come in, to see me about the D result, the supervisor. And I was going, this is just, what a man, fantastic. And the gentleman came in with a stack of paper, like a box of paper, and emptied it on the desk. And I said, well, look, tell me, how, how are you going, and what's happening, and what's, what are you feeling, and what can I do to help? And he said, look, I need advice because what's been raised in this examiner's report, and we had it in front of us, and we were reading it together, I've addressed in every single draft. And he had a year of drafts in front of him, and we went through it, and every single thing so upsetting. Every single thing, line upon line, that this examiner said in that report, the supervisor had been saying to the student for the last year, in track change, you need to address this, the examiner will pick it up. And the advice was ignored, and the examiner picked it up. Okay, don't three. Don't ignore the deadlines that your supervisor gives you. This is a huge one. And the reason that supervisors give you deadlines, particularly supervisors who teach undergraduate students, is that we know our work pattern a year in advance. In academic life, we're one of the few occupations where we know 12 months in advance what our peak periods of work are going to be. So therefore, we give you deadlines. We need this draft by here because we know the following week we're going to get 170 first year papers okay, that have to be returned. The trouble is, if you miss those deadlines, then suddenly there actually is no space or leverage or opportunity to give you feedback quickly. If you miss a deadline, we're, we're pretty well stuffed. So you have to work to deadlines and so does, does your supervisor. And if you don't respect those deadlines, then your supervisor does not have control over when they deliver that feedback to you. So when you're saying, you know, where's my professional relationship, I'm waiting for the feedback. Did you miss a deadline? And you've got to look in the mirror and ask yourself that question. Okay, don't for, huge, crucial, big. Don't think short term. The best supervisory relationships last decades. Remember, you could end up a referee for your supervisor. And that is a statement in your life that you have lived an academic career of integrity, decency, and respect. And it really happens. So I think we learn a few lessons from that. So don't burn out your supervisor in three years of candidature. That relationship should last 30 years or sometimes 50. So let me give you a personal example of this. And it's a lovely story and it's my pleasure to share it. So, I have a former PhD student, Dr. Amanda Evans, who is now Dr. Amanda Tilt. And I taught her in the first tutorial, as a casual tutor, the first tutorial I ever taught in university. She was in that tutorial. It was a small tutorial, that was the time, it was about 14 people. They were the tutorial sizes then. And that tutor was in 1992. <laughs> we were both incredibly young. And remarkably, when I got a contract, an A-level contract job in Queensland, Amanda moved to Queensland to do her honours year with me. Looking back on it now, it's like, what a courageous young woman. Got first class honours. Then she moved back to Western Australia when I got a tenured post at Murdoch University. And she got a scholarship, completed her PhD in three years, one of the youngest graduates ever in the history of Murdoch University. And she's worked in an array of remarkable academic jobs. She's had two truly brilliant, fabulous children. And she still is one of the most edgy, provocative, interesting writers and researchers I've ever come across. She also has a remarkable husband, Tony Tewitt. Tony, who's also a great friend of mine. Now, the reason I'm telling you this story is this is an example of a strong, solid, powerful, professional relationship that became a lot more as the decades passed. And this relationship has been based on honesty, decency, respect, and profound loyalty. And loyalty is a word we rarely talk about these days. We learn a lot about her time, I think. That if she needs me, I'm there. If I need her, she's there. Loyalty to the end. 
And it's no accident, I think, that when I recently married the wonderful Professor Jamie Quinton, that you might have seen Amanda if you've seen the wedding video, because Amanda was one of the people that stood up with me. She and Tony travelled the night before the wedding from Perth to get there. But what you might not know is Amanda was also in the wedding party when I married Steve Redhead decades before. She was one of the first people that was there when Steve died. And much to my amusement, it's a great story, 30 seconds after I announced that Jamie and I were getting married, 30 seconds, I, I was about to send her the first invitation to the wedding. But before I had a chance to send her that invitation, she'd immediately emailed me back and said, right, well, I'm coming and I'm assuming I'm in the wedding party. And within 30 minutes, she booked a flight. So, 1992, 2020, through life and death and kids and jobs. That's a supervisory relationship, respecting the time, respecting the distance, respecting the person, and yes, loyalty. Yeah. Don't five. Don't forget your supervisor is human. Really, really sad situations emerge. Really bad stuff, really bad stuff. It's when students forget their supervisor was a human being. And sadly, it happens frequently. Students forget that their supervisor gets sick, has families that get sick, confront extraordinary personal tragedies. But I think students also forget, and I understand why, and you will learn this probably the hard way, but I think students forget that the university is a workplace. And internationally, the university is a pretty damn toxic workplace at the moment. And supervisors protect you. We protect you from the vagaries, from the excesses of higher education. So you don't see the really brutal parts of what happens in the daily life of a university. And when you forget that actually the supervisor is getting a fair amount of buffeting on a daily basis, then your disrespect can do some really profound damage to your supervisor's life. So let me give you one personal example of this from one of my former universities. Three of my PhD students started at the same time, were finishing at the same time. And they were meant to give me their drafts in October. So I'd be able to pace them out and get them through so they would be able to hand their thesis in in January. Three of them, waiting for the draft since October. And all three submitted their drafts to me on December 24. So I had 300,000 words to draft and read between Christmas Day and New Year's Day. Now I really take holidays and I've certainly never managed to take a Christmas day without working for 25 years. Three of those 25 years were caused by pretty bonkers deans who sent me an email early Christmas day and said, by the close of business today, could you deliver this for me? So yeah, that, that's happened three times. The rest of those Christmases that I've lost have happened because students, particularly PhD students, have needed work done from me. Now I should have been reading their drafts in October. That's when the due date was that I could have done a draft in November, we would have been winning. But instead they delivered the drafts to me, all three of them, on December 24, assuming that I would read them in the week up to New Year's Day. And look, I did read those drafts. I did, I thought, God, I'm exhausted, God, can I do it? And I went, okay, I'm gonna read those drafts. But think about those students. Those students really, really disrespected me. And they treated me like I wasn't even human, like I was a drafting machine. So I didn't have the right to a day off. They had a right to miss deadlines. I didn't have the right to a day off. So if you are interested in professional relationships, professional relationships start when we recognise that both parties are human. And if you treat your supervisor like a slave, without friends, without family responsibilities, without issues and health and wellness and so forth, if you assume that you can give a draft to a supervisor at a really inconvenient point and you can go have a nice time with your family and they lose time with their family, then you need to look in the mirror and recognise what you've just done. Because you haven't behaved with ethics and decency and accountability. So professionalism is a dialogue. 
Marika, thank you so much for this suggestion. The literature I've read for this one was moving and strange and complex, and I've enjoyed doing this vlog. It's a tough vlog, and I've raised some issues for your consideration. As always, you can absolutely radically disagree with me and have a good go, and I'd love to have a chat as I always do. So if you disagree with me, that's absolutely cool, because that's what academic life is about. It's about respectful disagreements, and indeed, respectful difference. I wish you love, light and peace. Tea and Chuck.